for, uh, for having me here. Um, so today I'm going to talk um, a little bit about uh, music and, and video, uh, kind of a subset of you know, all the big data that is out there. Uh, my personal background uh, kind of all started here in, in Berkeley. I did my PhD here. Um, my focus uh, since then has always been machine learning, and that's kind of like the common thread uh, to my uh, research uh, and entrepreneurial life. Uh, but so music and video is one of these areas that I've spent a very significant amount of time on, and believe it or not, uh, the way that I got in there uh, was when I arrived at UCSD as a faculty member in, in 2005. I um, had a couple students that came to me over a student barbecue and they were very excited about trying to find a drummer for their music band and um, somehow they talked me into it, although I didn't know how to play drums whatsoever. <laughs> uh, that's what we do, right? We just adventure around. Um, and um, you know, eventually I discovered that you know, their primary uh, goal was not really to find a good drummer. Their primary goal was to actually build a music room. And they were looking for a space to do that. And I just happened to have a very big garage at the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it all started. Um, but so all that, you know, that project actually really moved forward. And so we built a music room in the garage. Um, and we started to record you know, a lot of our, I would say, semi-musical creations. Um, and so as we were doing that, you know, this was 2005, uploading our music into MySpace was kind of the primary <laughs> platform at the time. And so we quickly realized, you know, what lots of musicians were realizing, which is that, you know, suddenly we were one very small fish of that very big pool of music content that was out there. Um, at the time, we were talking more about maybe millions of songs, you know, that were in the typical online catalogs, uh, except uh, for MySpace probably, which at the time already had tens of millions of kind of audio waveforms online. Um, and on one side, so you get that big pool of data there, but on the other hand, um, as you can probably expect, maybe only like one or two percent of that pool of data was really consumed by end users. Um, you know, it's a typical thing, for example, at iTunes, you know that I think it's about one or two percent of their catalog or even less it is responsible for 99 or 99.5 percent of their sales. Um, and so same thing, you know, on MySpace, you get a couple of artists that get a lot of exposure, but literally 99.5 percent of the content is just sitting there not going anywhere. And sure, you know, some of that content was ours, and I don't really think that that should have been very broadly exposed, maybe. But there's other artists as well that actually are creating very good content, and it's just sitting there, and it's not going anywhere. And so for us, that was really the motivation to start thinking about, like, so what can we do to kind of connect that big pool of data with the end user? Because there's users out there that would like to discover new content, or that want to search for a specific type of music. For example, you know, they go work out, come back home from a date, or there's another special occasion that you know, asks for a certain type of music, they just like to find you know, music for that occasion without having to really kind of think it through or know an artist's name or a song title from the top of their head. Okay, so that's how all of this started. Um, of course, you know, first step or first idea was, don't these songs have you know, metadata that we can use you know, to that purpose? But the reality is that for you know, a lot of the songs out there, for example, on MySpace at the time, nowadays on many of these other platforms as well, there actually isn't all that much metadata besides artist name and song title that makes it easy to search that content or discover new content if you don't know the name of the artist or the song title. Um, of course, there's always the collaborative filtering mechanism, which a lot of um, um, providers of online music are using the kind of system of you know people who bought that book on Amazon also bought that book right uh, but the problem with that uh, mechanism is that it is not always adequate like for example you know when we recorded a song in our garage and then we upload that into MySpace nobody have ever bought that song or listened to it right so this type of song could never get recommended uh, through a collaborative filtering mechanism there's also increasingly nowadays the issue with popularity bias in um, collaborative filtering data, especially as you know, the, the amount of data is growing very, very dramatically. And then there's also the issue that you know, collaborative filtering focuses a lot on like, kind of what the average user will listen to, like what does an average playlist look like. But by looking at the average, you kind of steer yourself away from the outliers and the surprise effect. Somebody listening to you know, rock and roll for a while may suddenly want to switch to classical music, right? You don't really capture that necessarily through um, you know, collaborative filtering um, data. 
So therefore, what we decided to do was not use this type of data, but basically generate our own data by analyzing the actual waveform of the song. Okay? And basically using signal processing and machine learning to analyze the waveform and then associate that music waveform with descriptive tags. That could be from all kinds of categories. Right? It could be mood tags, instrument tags, genre tags, and things like that. And then use those tags to organize large catalogs to provide recommendations from large catalogs and allow people to browse them, okay? Not necessarily requiring explicit artist names and song titles, okay? So an important note that I should uh, mention here is when we started doing this, there were other people that had also started to do that. For example, including Pandora, you know, one of the companies that is now very well known. 10 years ago, they were not that well known. Um, their main approach to this was the picture on the left-hand side here, which is basically people listening. Nowadays, that has changed a bit, but 10 years ago, the way that they built up their catalogs was by having musical artists listening to hundreds and hundreds of songs over days and weeks and years. And as you may remember, actually, from the first uh, picture that I showed in the talk here, all the way in the beginning, you may have noticed or not, but so the catalog of Pandora is actually significantly smaller than the catalog of many of these other online music providers. And so one of the reasons for that is that they actually have a human tagging every individual song in their catalog. So building a catalog of a million songs will take some time, okay? As opposed to other music services that are more relying on a collaborative filtering type mechanism, so they can just ingest a huge catalog and then you know whatever gets bought or whatever gets consumed, they'll collect data and they'll recommend more of that. But as a result, you know you end up only recommending a fraction of your catalog because only for that fraction you have that user data, right? So what we very specifically wanted to do here was really taking that Pandora model, but then fully automate it and have computer algorithms do this automatically in a matter of seconds rather than requiring 20 or 30 minutes of human labor to annotate these songs. So that was our starting point. Um, technologically, what we, the first step um, you know, to get there uh, was building this black box, this algorithm that would ingest songs and then automatically tag them, okay? So tagging with tags from you know, a very diverse dictionary, like for example, we would tag them with genre tags, with uh, mood tags, instrument tags, usage tags, like you know, good for working out at the gym versus you know, good for a date or something like that. And so the idea here is to build an algorithm such that given an audio waveform with, without any other information, okay, the computer algorithm can then figure out which tags from that dictionary are most likely good associations uh, with that song. Okay, and then if you can do that for a million or tens of millions of songs, then eventually you end up with a fully tagged database, and then given that database, you can now start using that for all kind of you know recommendation problems, right? So for example, if people you know want to explicitly look for some happy rock and roll for working out, then you can match these tags against the tags in your database and build a you know kind of list of recommended songs that way. That is one mechanism. Um, another probably more popular mechanism is people are already listening to you know, a certain song or they have a library with a set of songs. And then uh, starting from that seed song or those seed songs, then you know, recommend similar music. And you can achieve that simply by taking the seed song, associating that song with tags, and then building a playlist um, of songs that have similar tags associated with it. In fact, this mechanism is exactly what Pandora does. But again, the difference here is, is that they build this huge database over a matter of years, in fact, more than a decade now, um, instead of uh, automatically, okay? So opening the box quickly, just a little bit of you know, technical content um, for uh, the ones amongst you that are interested in, in hearing a little bit more about that. Uh, so signal processing and machine learning is really what kind of drives um, most of this. Um, at a high level, what you do basically in these approaches is you collect some examples of a category of songs that you're interested in. For example, songs that make you happy or rock and roll songs or something like that. So you collect a bunch of sample songs for that and then at a high level what you're going to do is you're going to try to find patterns that are common amongst these songs and use that pattern to identify you know, some new future song as you know, a rock and roll song. 
So of course, the big question is, what type of patterns am I looking for, and what statistical models are going to identify these patterns, right? So at a high level, what we do is uh, we take these audio waveforms, okay, and we chop them into little pieces. These little pieces here, so the, the blue segments are usually about 50 to 100 milliseconds. And then for each of these little pieces, you extract descriptors, you know, things like spectral contents, things like loudness, like pitch information, timbre information, etc. And so for each of these pieces, you extract that type of information and you map it into a point in some, you know, high dimensional feature space. So as a result, when you ingest a song like this here, you basically transform it into a cloud of points where each point represents the you know, properties or um, other information about each little piece of the song. And at that point, you can go crazy. You can fit all, any of your you know, um, favorite statistical models against this cloud of green points here to somehow model what you know, audio content is present in that song. Of course, we're not interested in individual songs. What we're interested in here is modeling uh, semantic associations, tags, right? So for that, what you do is you take a set of songs that you have associated with a tag that you're interested in modeling. You then basically combine all that data together and fit a model now not to an individual song, but now to the characteristic audio content of that set of songs that you have reliably associated through some training data with you know, one or more tags of interest. Okay, and then once you've done that, then you can use this library of statistical models, one such model for each tag that you're interested in, to analyze a new song, right? So given a new song, you do the same thing, you chop it into little pieces, you basically that way transform the song into some you know, cloud of descriptors that are describing um, the different pieces of your song. And then depending on which of the statistical models corresponding to all the tags of interest in your dictionary are most likely to predict you know, the shape of this uh, sound cloud, so to speak, you can then you know, compute uh, weights of how relevant each of the tags in your dictionary is to describe this song here. And again, you do this for one song, you can do this for millions of songs, you create your database and then you, know, you can go from there. So by the end of the day, what you end up doing is given a song, you're basically associating some sort of kind of histogram or fingerprint with that song that tells you, that describes to you, you know, which semantic associations are very strong and which semantic associations are very low for that particular song. But again, the interesting way to look at this is really some sort of compact fingerprint describing, you know, that kind of, you know, elaborate waveform um, for indexing in, in a search database. Now, that all said, Okay, there we go. Um, so to give you a little bit more technical background here, so that was our starting point, very simple model, take a big database, index the thing, and then see what happens, right? Well, one of the things that we saw that happens is that the models that we were using, for example, if you were to uh, kind of describe the shape of this, you know, acoustic cloud, so to speak, with a, a Gaussian mixture model, you know, very simple first step, then one of the things that would happen is that if you were to take this, um, audio waveform here, after you chop it into little pieces and you shook it around, basically permuting all these little pieces into some random order, okay? And with the model that I just described to you, the shape of this cloud here would not change. And so as a result, your statistical model here would not detect any difference. But I tell you, if you were to listen to this here, <laughs> it sound quite different, right? So anyways, even with that kind of very you know, cruel approximation that we were making initially uh, in our models, we're actually doing pretty decent already. We started to pick up signal. Because what were we picking up? Well, what we were picking up was information that is very characteristic to just these little pieces here, like timbre, like pitch, like tonal information, right? But what you're missing is the ordering between these pieces, things like rhythm, you know? So in order to incorporate that as well, you have to somehow model the order of these blue pieces. So the way we would do that is we would take a whole bunch of them, like 100 or 200 of them, glue them together into a, and not allow them to get permuted or anything like that, and then model that sequence as a sample from a linear dynamic system, which also could be called dynamic textures in the video space, or sometimes it's called Kalman filters in you know, the control space, right? So anyways, what we're doing here is we're basically taking this sequence 
of 50 millisecond segments, and we're modeling them as a sample from this linear dynamic system here, where you have you know, some observed variables, observed nodes that model the uh, specific characteristics of each of these blue pieces, and then you have some hidden nodes that kind of you know, model the background linear dynamics in, 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 in the model, right? Anyways, I'm not going to go into much detail here. One thing I should point out is that you can just take one such model and model an entire song because the dynamics of an intro and an outro and a guitar solo, things like that are very different. So you need to consider a statistical mixture model of such dynamic systems to actually model your, uh, your song more kind of, you know, appropriately. And when you do that, then you end up with, you know, the typical mixture model. Uh, consisting of several mixture components where each mixture component now is not just a Gaussian blob, for example, but is an entire dynamic system. And then each, so this is a song again here in the bottom, the vertical axis is just, you know, color indicating the different, the spectral content, content in the different bands. Um, but so basically what will happen is that each of these mixture components will be the dominant one to generate certain segments of the song. Okay, so for example, here in the first segment, we have one dynamic system that is predominantly generating the audio content, and in other segments, you get other mixture components that become mostly active. One nice thing is if you fit such a statistical model to a song, it actually turns out that it is also a way to segmenting the song in a pretty much automated fashion. With very little post-processing, you can actually get very good song segmentations that way, or video segmentations if you were to apply this to video. Anyways, one of the downsides of these type of models is that you have to decide a priori to, decide to, to use this model that I just presented to you. Either you have to decide I'm going to use this type of model for all my songs or I'm going to use a Gaussian model or something else like, you know, autoregressive models or whatever other, you know, time series model you want to use. And you also have to, for each of these models, decide how big each of these blue pieces is. You have to decide on a certain time scale. And so then there was some other problem here too, which is that if you're really starting to kind of grow this to very large databases, but even more importantly to very large dictionaries, and for some of these tags you only have a few songs examples, you know, if you're making your models very complex, it becomes more and more of a challenge to kind of reliably fit, um, you know, those models to smaller sets of training songs. So we needed to kind of like try to come up with a different approach to integrate the, um, the richness of all these models that we talked about before, rather than just picking one. And so the way we did that was by looking at the text space. What do people do with text documents? Well, the text space usually one of the very kind of traditional ways to represent a text is a so-called bag of words <laughs> model where you read through the text and you're basically counting words as they occur and then summarizing the result in a histogram of word counts over a certain dictionary, right? Now, how about if we did the exact same thing here now with music? Of course, the problem with music is that music is not, you know, kind of written as clearly as text. It's a very noisy signal. So therefore, instead of using very clearly defined words, why don't we use words that are statistical models in themselves? So not just like a characteristic audio feature, but an entire model that has a certain mean, a certain variance, certain you know, confidence information built into itself, possibly certain linear dynamic information or nonlinear dynamic information built into it. So at a high level, what we're doing here is we're first using all these models that we developed before, not to just pick one model now and model the music, but instead, Let's just look at everything that we've ever developed before. Let's throw all these models into a dictionary. Let's consider them at many different time scales as well. But instead of using them to directly model the audio content, let's use them as a dictionary of prototypical behaviors that we may observe in either music or video, okay? And then once we've done that, let's look at the audio signal and now just simply count which of these models are appearing with some high likelihood in your audio signal, okay? And the nice thing now is, is that you can now use at the same time models with, you know, a very kind of fine-grained time resolution as well as models with a much coarser grained time resolution, right? So when you do all that, you can now look at that audio signal and just like when you're constructing a bag of words for text, you can now count prototypical statistical models and their occurrence in that audio signal and construct a histogram of 
quote unquote acoustic word counts. Okay. And the nice thing is once you have this type of representation, then you just you can go off to the races and you can use any kind of you know popular document classification algorithm to then model tags as you know collections of songs that are represented in this kind of bag of words type representation, which here we call a bag of systems representation, because each of the words is of course a, a statistical model here. So anyway, so what's nice about this, as I said before, it allows you to kind of really use the richness of all of these models. Because as I said before, some of these models that look at, you know, kind of the little chunks are very good at, you know, picking up tonality information, pitch, and things like that. The, the dynamic models are better at picking up things like rhythm, for example. But of course, what you'd like to do is you'd like to pick up all of it. So you want to consider all these model classes at the same time. You also want to consider them at multiple time scales, and this approach allows you to do that, okay? Um, it also has you know, a lot of other interesting advantages. I'm not gonna go into detail about it here, but for example, if you want, you can now start using some very complicated language models as well, like for example, LDA or hierarchical Dirichlet processes and things like that. All these models that have mostly been developed to model text can now be immediately extended to be used for music, and in fact, beyond that, general audio and video content as well. So anyways, back to the higher level now. So once we have these models, we can then build this database and use it for you know, music recommendation like I explained before, either given a text-based query or given a sample song. We can now you know, construct these lists of recommended songs. Um, you know, as I said before, collaborative filtering is an approach that can also be used for that, right? whether based on explicit or implicit user feedback. But the challenge there is indeed for items so what you'll basically do is you're going to look for each item there, right? What is the usage pattern? Which users are consuming it and which ones are not consuming it? And then you will recommend other items that have been consumed by you know, a similar user set and assume that that you know, indicates that your items are somehow similar. But the problem is for items that users have never consumed, you really can't do much here. Um, and then there's other issues as well, like popularity bias, as what I was talking about before, that some very popular songs appear in every playlist and therefore, they will often appear in every recommendation, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily a very relevant recommendation for your seed song, right? And so as I said, so what we're doing here, basically, is we're using audio content to bypass these problems. But the way that we're doing that so far is by using these tags here, right? So you may wonder, like, how about not using the tags, but just using the audio content directly if at least the query were to be a seed song, right? So if your query is a seed song, why would you go through this whole process of first tagging the song and then using tag similarity to build a playlist as opposed to just directly using the audio content, right? And so one interesting uh, thing that happens here is that when you directly compare low-level audio features, there's actually a lot more noise in your data. And so the recommendations that you get can get more shaky. Like for example, you could have two songs that have a 10 second silence in them, but that doesn't mean that they're very similar, right? Um, so the tags are a higher level description and are a more robust way to obtain you know, better recommendations. Now that said, your audio signal is still the signal that contains the richest information by the end of the day, right? It's just that there's a lot of noise besides that information. So one of the things that we also do is using machine learning then to extract the most useful acoustic information directly from the sound signal to then make recommendations from that extracted information without the noise. And so the idea really here is to develop uh, machine learning algorithms that allow you to extract what is most predictive in the raw audio content for good recommendations without you know, retaining the noise. But the interesting thing here is, is that the eventual kind of target that you're trying to optimize is providing good recommendations, good rankings. It's not like, you know, um, a machine learning problem to optimize the classification performance or something like that, right? So from a technical perspective, this actually gives uh, rise to some very interesting, um, you know, algorithms where you're trying to optimize NDCG, uh, you know, top 10 of the ranking, precision at K, and, you know, metrics like that that are, um, more common torque in behavior and, and harder to optimize. Anyways, I'm not going to go into detail here, but this uh, kind of on the machine learning side of things, it certainly gives rise to a suite of very interesting problems. Uh, also, on top of that, of course, you could say like, well, instead of just, you know, using tags, 
or instead of just using audio content, why don't we use both at the same time? Or even more, if other information is available online, like blogs, lyrics about these songs, social networks between artists, or videos or pictures about the, the bands, why don't we use that information as well to improve our music recommendations, right? And so this is certainly also one of the areas that we do a lot of work on, really using that you know, kind of multimodal data, so to speak, very heterogeneous sources of information, integrate all of them together to make you know, better uh, recommendations. So all of that, uh, besides you know, having been a, a very kind of uh, intense academic journey, also resulted in um, a company called Kivio that my, uh, one of my students started. Um, and so somehow that was really kind of the, uh, the, the, the kind of final big accomplishment for us there was that we, uh, so from the get-go when we started doing all of this in, in 2005, 2006, our, our goal was always like, hey, can we recreate Pandora overnight, okay? And so, you know, last year that eventually happened, I mean, it wasn't overnight, it took us a weekend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we did, you know, recreate a catalog of about, you know, a million and a half songs, which is roughly, you know, the size of the catalog that uh, Pandora has nowadays. Um, of course, people always ask me, like, so how do you deal with, uh, you know, licensing, things like that? Um, so what we did here in this case, uh, we uh, built it as a music video recommendation platform where we extracted um, a lot of the video from, from YouTube and from other sources. Um, so we actually don't own the content, we just stream it from them. Um, and uh, let's see, so the, and the, the technology on the back end that was used to build the music recommendations is exactly what I've been uh, explaining before here. Um, now, that all said, uh, and this is what I really wanted to say, um, what I just explained here for music is also applicable for generic audio, okay? There's really no distinction between kind of using these models for a musical waveform or for certain kind of environmental sounds, for example, right? Um, that could be picked up by microphone from our smartphones, right? Um, even more, you could also use this to analyze videos, not just by analyzing the visual content of the video, but also the audio track. Okay, and so this is uh, some kind of, it's a very interesting avenue because a lot of the uh, kind of video big data processing that is uh, happening nowadays is based on tags that are extracted from wherever, you know, from the web page where the video appears. But these tags can be very noisy. Um, so to get better information about what's happening inside the video, kind of the obvious kind of way to do it is by looking at the visual content. But it turns out if you just listen to a video, that there's actually a lot you can tell about it already. And even more than that, the audio track of a video is a lot more efficient to process than the visual information. Okay, now the good thing about all that I have said so far is that it applies both to audio as well as video. The only difference is that for the visual track you'll have a three-dimensional signal rather than a one-dimensional signal because now you're looking at you know, two-dimensional frames basically that follow each other in time. But the point here is, is that what you can do now is you can first analyze the audio track as some sort of first processing and then you can extract a bunch of information from that and based on the information that you extract from the audio track then you can selectively process the visual information to have a more efficient way to analyze uh, online video. And you can then do that using this same you know, bag of systems approach like the dictionaries again but now you're going to have a visual dictionary and an acoustic dictionary and then you can start looking at correlated visual acoustic words as well. right? Um, so we um, applied that to a, a video recommendation engine um, with um, my students at, at Kivio, and so basically that allowed us to generate um, a variety of video channels about certain high-level uh, topics, and then within each, channel, within each channel, when you kind of click on these individual videos, since we're looking at these videos through this kind of more richer fingerprint than just one you know, category, right? We have dictionaries with 100, 200, or 500 words, uh, you can actually, within each channel, come up with some very refined recommendations as well. Like, for example, if you were to click on a beach video here that is about surfing, and you could very easily pick up other surf videos, but not necessarily videos of, you know, kids playing on the beach or the other way around, right? So by looking at these videos through these refined fingerprints, you can get uh, some very kind of refined recommendations as well within each channel. What do we use this for? 
a variety of applications uh, that Kivio is working on. One is, of course, just this idea of being able to recommend any song out there or any video out there. Uh, whether there's, it's a new song that you just added to your catalog, whether it's something that not a lot of people have consumed, or whether it's something that's just you know, user-generated content sitting on your smartphone, no tags, no nothing. You don't even know anymore that it's sitting there. We can process it. Okay. Also, of course, uh, filtering out undesired content is, uh, is, is, is an application where you know, very often the tags on online, around online video are not really going to help you to do that. Um, we don't see this as a competitor for collaborative filtering, but really as a way to complement collaborative filtering and kind of build you know, a holistic system that is just you know, more powerful than its individual parts to you know, keep engaging the customer that is looking for either music or video content. One of the very specific you know, ways that um, this content-based analysis really helps out, as I said before, is creating diversity in recommendations. Um, you know, pr providing more surprising recommendations as well, things that are very different because once you understand the content, you can figure out, oh, this user likes to listen to classical music and then suddenly switch to rap, for example, right? Um, also, you can kind of make recommendations more on a segment basis. I mean, think about Bohemian Rhapsody, right? That is not just one song, right? So things like that you can figure out while these, you know, collaborative filtering analysis is always looking at it at a holistic level. Um, and one more thing that I'm particularly kind of excited about, and I'll just kind of leave that on the table as a, as a takeaway here, is context-aware recommendation. Because today, you know, with the systems that we build, you still require the user to provide you with an active query, right? To indicate what they would like to listen to. But how about zero click? Can we do something that doesn't even require the user to tell you anything anymore? Can we figure out wh what is the user doing, how is the user feeling, and then make recommendations based on that? 10 years ago, this was tough. But today, with a suite of sensors sitting in our pocket on a daily basis, right, right, there's a lot of information right there to figure out immediately what it is that we're doing. So we can try to predict emotions. We can try to predict activities, and then match those predictions against you know, the similar tags from the songs in our database to make recommendations without requiring the user to enter a search query or provide um, an example song. And so what's very interesting about this here is that uh, the technology that you use to automatically annotate music or video here is actually not all that different from the technology that you can use to annotate time series data from sensors in these wearables here. But now, instead of associating it with tags that are mostly relevant to music, you're now going to associate these sensor signals with tags right? that say something more about either the activity of the user, the mood of the user, or other type of factors that you would like to incorporate to make better recommendations. And so, of course, we're not just talking about smartphones here, but there's also other wearables, especially smartwatches nowadays, or, um, looking very promising to become very broadly worn. Um, and of course, what's nice about the watches is that they can give you access to heart rate information, which is very, uh, very powerful to try to predict uh, mood-related um, uh, state, so to speak. Um, so I'll just skip uh, to the conclusion slide here, um, which is basically kind of, this is really my longer term view about this, is recommendation systems that recommend entertaining content to us, whether it is music or whether it is video, totally automatic, zero click. Of course, there will be thumbs up and thumbs down. We need to get feedback from the user to kind of build some sort of profile about that user, right? But you don't want to force people to type something like romantic jazz with saxophone, right? And then something pops up. No, you just want it to come to them. Pull out your phone and there is your radio station, right? And of course, one of the things that has happened here as kind of a very different track is that Lots of medical applications of this too, right? Um, so we have a lot of collaborations going nowadays with the medical school where, for example, one of our collaborators is very interested to use the, the, the algorithms that track the activity of a patient post-surgery, right? Because when the doctor asks, let's say there's a surgery that happens three weeks later, your doctor asks you, how have you been in the past two weeks? Have you been a good recovering patient? Most of the time we remember what we did yesterday, but not what we did the past two weeks, right? And so with this type of technology, you can now literally track 
uh, patients on a you know minute to minute basis over a week a two week period and give the physician some very detailed information about how the patient has been uh, recovering. This is uh, everybody who did the work uh, that I just uh, presented to you also uh, supported by um, both uh, government organizations as well as uh, many companies that are very interested in this. Um, if you have any more questions, I'll be around um, over lunch. And otherwise, feel free to uh, get in touch. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you may have mentioned this earlier, but I, I, I thought I might have heard something about it. When you were processing the signals, did you do that in collaboration, for example, with the written music? In collaboration with what? With the written music, in, in correlation with the written music. So you had the signal. Oh, the symbolic music, you mean. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we did not, for what we did, we usually did not have access to the, the symbolic music, the written music. Um, one possible way to try to extract features from the music is to try to transcribe it automatically. But that by itself is actually a very hard problem. And we found that doing that is just adding additional noise into the process. And it's better to just directly extract you know, the typical raw audio features from the waveform. But if the written music is available, then that certainly by itself could provide some you know, very good additional information. But it's just not very widely available usually. So there's a the follow-up question, if I may. If you had the written music and if you were able to correlate it with the signal, then there is a whole host of music analysis uh, totally. things that could perhaps reduce the noise. Yes, I totally agree. Okay. But you know, the interesting thing is that uh, you know, which music band writes down their music, right? <laughs> Think about it. And so that's, the, that's kind of the challenge here, because a lot of that music comes from these online channels. Uh, now, there's specific channels. Like if you're talking classical music, for example, then there is a lot of that information available. And it could be very helpful. Totally agree. Hi. Um, going back to the, uh, the bag of words analogy, um, so you have this dictionary. How do you curate it? How do you stem? I mean, what, what do you, how, how can you possibly manage that, a, and first, not only the audio systemic dictionary, but then the video one as well? Yeah, great question. And I, and I, I, and I did skip uh, that part here. Um, so what we do is, in order to curate the dictionary, we look at a lot of data, right? And so something very interesting about this approach is that to fine tune the words in a dictionary, we don't need label data. We just need data. We just need songs or videos, right? So what's very powerful about that is that usually there's a lot of data available, right? There's just not always a whole lot of label data, right? So the first approach where we are fitting the models based on label data directly, you run into the challenge constantly of like, well, if you want to fine tune things, you really need good label data. Here in this case, as we're fine-tuning fine -tuning these dictionaries, you can just do that by looking at as much labeled da unlabeled data as you have access to, and that can be a whole lot. And so as a result, you can often fine-tune the words in a dictionary much better than you could ever fine-tune the models for these you know, specific labels. How, how big is a dictionary? I'm just curious about the size or something. Yeah, so um, right now, most of the time, it's between 1,000 and 5,000 that we work with. Um, also, I should tell you that it works better if you're structuring your dictionary hierarchically. Um, so you're basically, because each of these words in a dictionary are <coughs> um, statistical models, right? And so you can construct a hierarchical dictionary where the words that are higher up in a dictionary are somehow kind of cluster centers, but in a probabilistic way then, of you know, kind of uh, lower level uh, words in a dictionary. Of course, which then means that you have to come up with algorithms that can cluster statistical models, and that's a whole other thing. But the point is when you use that kind of hierarchical structure and you use words through the full hierarchy, you get a more robust uh, way of uh, uh, representing your content and then making predictions. So it starts with about, I would say, you know, between 1,000 and five or 10,000 at the bottom, and then it goes up to maybe three or four layers with maybe 10 or, or 50 at the top. <laughs> 